I owe you a wrap up for quarter three and we are a third of the way through quarter two, quarter four, quarter, yes, I know what time is. So the books I'm going to talk about are the books that I read in quarter three, which is July, August, September. Really? No. Yes. No. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna do my best on the books that are from July. Uh, we'll see how much I remember. <laughs> I'll probably remember if I had strong feelings and if I don't remember anything, then that should tell you all you need to know about that book's um, longevity. So let's, yeah. I have some of the books physically, so the ones that I have physically I'll hold up. The rest I'm gonna be relying on Goodreads to remind me. I read more in quarter three than I read the rest of this year. The first two quarters of this year I didn't read nearly as much as I normally do. Oh and then yeah, I have been reading books. I think I mentioned this last two wrap-ups. I have been reading books for like vlog projects so that I, I don't talk about those. Actually, I don't mark them on Goodreads either. So anyway, there's some books that uh, you won't hear about until I'm done with um, my projects. Anyway, I'm pretty sure where we left off was The Last Murder at the End of the World. Like that was the last book I read in the previous quarter, I believe. So we're going to go with that. And if I missed some in, the, in this like transition, then I apologize. So I think the first book that I read in quarter three, I do have here physically. And that is Imagine Me by Tehada Mafi, which is the sixth and I would have said final book in the Shatter Me series, but then my friend kindly texted me to let me know that another Shatter Me book is coming out. I gave this one, I think, well, Goodreads is right here actually, but I have to click into it. Why can't you just tell me? Yeah, I gave it three stars. Shatter Me is a series that like, I don't think anyone expected me to, I didn't expect me to like it. Uh, I still don't totally understand. That's not true. I defend liking it. Yeah, it's definitely not one of those that you'd be like, that's a Lana series. I, I didn't, I forget why I started reading it. It was years and years ago. I think I read the first one as like a let's try it and see or like I think I did a vlog for it or something. I don't know. And when I first started reading the first one I was like this is terrible. And then halfway through the first one I was like do I like this? And by the end of the first one I was like I don't know if I like this but I definitely want to read the next one. And then I just like devoured the most of the rest of the series. And here we are. Um, originally it was a trilogy and then she added on three more books. So this is the sixth book and is the third in like the second trilogy. The second trilogy at, was like both a great and a bad idea. So like I did feel like there was more to the story like when the first trilogy ends. I was like yeah you could definitely do more here that ended kind of abruptly. And the first book in the second trilogy, Restore Me, I thought was the best in the series. Like I was like thank goodness we're doing a second trilogy because wow yes this is the best yet. Then the second book in the new trilogy, so the fifth book, was markedly a step down and then I'd heard that this one wasn't that good like from fans of the series which made me think that I was like uh, I'll get to it when I get to it. So I finally did read it and like with pretty much every other Shatter Me book like it was really quick to read once I did read it. Tehada Mafi's writing style for me anyway is like propulsively readable so I think is that why I picked this up? I think I was like in a bit of a reading slump when I picked this up at the beginning of this of this quarter three and I was like I need to read something that I know I'm just gonna like devour. So I started reading Imagine Me and I was like, yep, <laughs> this is doing it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I said I gave it three stars. It's not great. Will I read the next new Shatter Me book? Yes, I will. Maybe it'll be better. Do we need another Shatter Me book? We really, really don't. <laughs> like, it expanded the world a great deal, the second trilogy, but I, I think she's like run out of material. <laughs> and if we're gonna keep dragging on the relationship drama, I I'll tell you what, why I love this series, two reasons. So how do um, prose, like I think she actually is a wordsmith. I think there is genuine poetry to be found in the Shatter Me series, however like cringy and like YA it is. So I just enjoy, um, above all things as a reader, good prose. Like I say I'm a character driven reader and I certainly am, but more than anything, I'm a prose driven reader. If you show me artistry in your prose, that I'm going to be on board to like at least give you a chance at like whatever story you're telling. Yeah, like Abercrombie, wordsmith. Patrick Rothfuss, wordsmith. Jean Wolf, wordsmith. Tehada Mafi, I would argue, wordsmith. And then Kenji, the character Kenji, who's like a, the, like the best friend type character to our main female character. I would die for Kenji. He is so precious and hilarious and I love him to pieces. So I'm really never tired of seeing him in this series. So for if the next book is just like an all Kenji book, you know, they might be the Jack Sparrow problem if he works better as a side character than as a main character, but I love Kenji. Yeah, it did what it needed to do for me, as in, like, 
it was a quick read that pulled me out of a slump and I could just chew through and then finally be done. Well, I thought be done with the series. I was like, fine, like I check that off. And then right immediately thereafter, I was like, oh, actually there's gonna be another book. <laughs> you waited so long to finish the series. There's actually gonna be another book now. So dang it. <laughs> um, uncheck that series because there's another one. Okay, the next book that I read is also the next in my stock. And that is The Wizard by Jean Wolfe. This is a bind up of The Wizard and the Knight which is a little confusing because the order, the reading order is the knight and then the wizard, but the bind up is called the wizard knight. And I read this with my patrons. Um, we read Jean Wolfe books together now is a thing that we do. So my patrons and I read together the book of the new sun and like did like a lengthy chats for each installment. Cause there's like a lot of, lot to chew through with Jean Wolfe. And then we did the same thing, less to chew through with this than with Book of the New Sun. Book of the New Sun is just like, you know, you could spend years and years, and people do spend years and years analyzing that text. This is not nearly like that, but we had a good time chatting about it and picking it apart. So we did the same with this, where we read The Knight together and then The, the Wizard together. Uh, this is definitely not my favorite Jean Wolfe. Um, I, the Book of the New Sun is way better. But we had a really interesting discussion and there were like things about it that I really, really enjoy and really appreciate because it's Jean Wolfe. Wordsmith. So yeah, I, I think I'm more um, appreciative of sort of like the project of this and like kind of what he was attempting to do than the execution. The execution still had like a lot of food for thought and a lot of food for discussion, but as a reading experience, it wasn't as enjoyable. Like I didn't have like fun reading it as much as like the Book of the New Sun. It's also kind of hard to say that you have fun reading it, but I would say that I did have fun reading Book of the New Sun. This less so, this more so I was just like kind of interested to discuss it and kind of see what other people were thinking about it and what we might kind of like parse about what he was doing with it. So yeah, I mean, I'm glad I read it. It was good to discuss it, but this wouldn't be like if I was doing a recommendations list of like, you know, Gene, like must read Gene Wolfe. Like uh, I'd be like, well, you know, he's a good writer. He probably, you can't really go wrong reading Gene Wolfe, but definitely not my top favorite. We are reading next, I don't know when exactly, but soonish, probably the new year. Together we're going to read Latro in the Mist. I'm very much looking forward to that. Anyway, so like interesting, intriguing. It's Wolf, so it's opaque. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, I, I enjoyed it. I did, I'm glad I read it. The next book I read, I'm pretty sure I don't have a copy of, that's correct. It's uh, First Lie Wins by Ashley Elston. And First Lie Wins is, um, it is adult thriller mystery, but I believe the, if this is, I think the author has previously written YA. And if that's not true, I do know for sure that this was originally intended to be YA and then was instead like revised and published to be adult. And when I found that out a lot, it made a lot more sense to me why it was the way that it was because it does read quite juvenile and like the twists and OMG moments of like the every chapter ending on a what? It was very much giving CW show. This would keep company with those like teen dramas where you're like, I know it's not good, but oh God, I gotta want to find out what happens next. And the resolution to the mystery of what's been going on, it, there was a way to do it that would have been better, but it would have been less of a nice ending. And I was really, really hoping that we would go there, that we would do what, how it should have ended, but instead we, again, that's why it reminded me of a CW show. It ended the way a CW show would choose to end it, where like, it's like the nicer, pleasanter version, where you're like, eh, it's not really as believable or as interesting, but okay. If it had gone there with the ending, I might even have given it four stars, even though it's, it's a pretty juvenile, not that great a thriller. I guessed a lot of the twists before they happened. If it had done the ending right, again, I would have given it a lot of points for that. It didn't. So I was like, okay, this is like three stars. I think I gave it three stars. Did I? Let's not tell a lie to the entire internet. Yeah, I gave it three stars. All right. The next book I read, I do have a physical copy of, but I'm not really going to talk about it because I talked about it in my previous video at length. There's a few on here like that. So I will direct you there. It is Kingdom of the Wicked by Carrie Maniscalco. Like I said, talked about this in my previous video, the video on romanticy. So if you want to know what I thought about this, go there. Am I going to tell you what I rated it? What did I rate it? <laughs> I'll tell you what I rated it if I remember what I rated it. I rated it also three stars. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. The next book I read, kind of forgot I read this. So that should tell you something. When Among Crows by Veronica Roth. This was my first Veronica Roth book. I love this cover. 10 out of 10 cover. And I actually, I thought this was like a full novel. When this arrived, at my house, I was like, where's the rest of it? And I think this would have benefited a great deal from her writing it as a short book. <laughs> and she didn't. By which I mean, we spend a lot of page count that we just don't have. Like we don't have the time for that in such a short book on like world building stuff that we're not like setting up a long series. We're not even setting up a long book. We are like in and out, like 
This is quick. This is a very short story. We need the essentials of the world conveyed to us so that we can like follow what's happening and understand the stakes and any reversals. But like going into a lot of detail to kind of set up rules and to set up like again the the world that this takes place in like maybe she plans to write novels in this world and that's why he did that but this is not the place for that we need to latch onto the characters latch onto the story and be hooked by that and you have enough information to be able to get through this we cannot be spending like what is this 100 pages 200 pages 150 pages thereabouts we cannot be spending like 75 of those pages on world building because most of this should be the characters in the story and, and like what we're doing with that. I don't want to be getting the the download, the Wikipedia, the like 101 on your world for the majority of this tiny book. That's boring and that's not worth it. So the beginning of this book, it does kind of dump you in and we start in medias res. Media res? Medias res. I always say it wrong. We start in the middle of the action. And at first it seemed like one of those where we're just going to get dumped in and kind of like pick it up as we go. And I was like, yes that. More authors should do that. But no, we started like that to kind of like hook you. And then we went back and explained everything in detail. And I was like, no, <laughs> I think there's like, there is a good book in here somewhere, but it is so bogged down by unnecessary detail that did con that contributed nothing, certainly not to my enjoyment. So I guess if you're the type of person that just devours world building information, just like encyclopedic nonsense about things that don't exist, uh, maybe this is for you, but no, this is not the place. Not the time, not the place. Uh, the next book I read was Night Watching by Tracy Sierra, and I really, really liked this. I really, really liked this. I forget why I read it or why I picked it up. I saw it somewhere and I was like, oh, does my library have it? I think it does. What do I want to say? I don't want to like spoil it. I just think it does an unreliable narrator really well, and I think it does an excellent, excellent job of conveying the sort of moment to moment terror of being in the situation that our characters are in. So the book itself like isn't doing anything, isn't describing anything, isn't portraying anything that's like so much scarier than other thrillers have. But like a lot of books, you know, like if there's reading about it isn't the same. Hey, stop! Reading about it is really different from if you experienced it. So like something really minor in your life would be like would shake you in a way that if you read about it, you'd be like, whatever, that's not that big a deal because we're all heartless. <laughs> but I think an author that's really able to like kind of put you in the shoes of the character that's experiencing this to, to where the little things that in real life would kind of freak you out, you are like successfully transported to the experience of the little things are freaking you out. So I think we are really really successfully transported to the experience of this main character um, psychologically and also like really like what's happening to her to a, to the point where like every little thing like it's, it's kind of a slow paced book there's not a lot that happens but it's this kind of like moment to moment terror of like if you were really in that situation and how that would feel and how that would like unnerve you so I think the book just really really does like atmosphere and like psychology and like emotional state kind of like conveyance really really well so the story itself is like fine and it actually did some things that i think uh there was something about with the story that like i kind of thought that i might know where it was going and i wasn't a too big a fan of where i thought it might be going and then it, it didn't go there it, it went differently and i was pleased by that so yeah i would highly recommend it it's one of the best thrillers that i've ever read again not because like the story is the most thrilling or the most like twisty or anything like that. I just think the author does such a good job of transporting you to that experience in a way that feels like visceral and unnerving. All right, next I read House of Open Wounds, which is the second book in the Tyrant Philosophers. Did I know the series was called that? Um, It's the, oh my gosh, what was the first book? C City of Last Chance, City of Last Chances by Adrian Tchaikovsky. So House of Open Wounds, I was not planning to read it because I didn't really like the first one. Like I didn't hate the first one. I just thought it was like, like missed potential, missed opportunity. There were things in it that I liked, but the execution ultimately was like not to my liking. It did remind me a bit of The Age of Madness by Joe Abercrombie in a way that I was like, yeah, but like Abercrombie does the like the Olympic level version of this. And this is like the amateur <laughs> version of this. So why would I read this when I can just go read Age of Madness? Anyway, so uh, a lot of people said, oh, but your complaints, like the things that you don't like about the first one, it's actually so much better in the second one. The second one will be the one that you actually really like because it's like doing things the way that you would want them to be done. And I still wasn't planning to read it. I was like, sure, I believe you maybe someday. No, I'm not gonna read it. Well, my patrons made me read it. So they like it won the poll and I vlogged it. And I was kind of mean in my vlog. I was like, why did you think I would like this? Why did you think I would like this better? I do not like this better. This is worse. Why do you not know me at all? Why would you think like, 
have I been unclear in what I want and what I like? I really did not like it. And then I especially did not like it because I'd been set up to expect that it would be better. If I had read it on my own steam after reading the first one being like, I guess I'll read the next one and then finding that I didn't like it, I'd be like, oh, well, that was worse. But because everyone's like, no, no, okay, like the first one, I get it, I get it. Your criticism's sure. But the second one, that's, you're gonna, that's gonna be your book. No, do you know me so little? No. <laughs> so yeah, I did not like, I think I gave that two stars. So yeah, no. Covers, again, for that series, 10 out of 10. Whoever's doing the covers for that series, knocking it out of the park. Wish I liked those books. Wish I wanted those books on my shelves. But I do not because I don't like those books. The next book that I read, my stack is ordered differently, but all right, Goodreads, we'll go with your order. The next book that I read, according to Goodreads, are you sure, Goodreads? All right whatever. No, you're wrong. Good. Well, whatever. I'll just go in your way. The next book I read was, I mean, not, that's not true. The next book on, according to Goodreads, is The Half-Blood Prince, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, um, which I read, uh, I'll probably do them all now, all together, even though I didn't completely read them back to back, but let's just do that. The books that Bookborn chose for me for our TBR swap. I chose four books. We were supposed to choose four books for each other. She chose five books for me. She cheated. So I chose four books for her to read and she chose four books for me to read. And then we talked about the books that I chose on my channel. So that's a few videos back. And then we talked about the books that she chose for me on her channel. So the chat for those is on her channel. So if you want to know what I thought about them in depth, that's where I will direct you to Book Orange channel. So the books that she chose for me, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows because she found out that I had never finished the series and Book Orange is obsessed with Harry Potter. Like obsessed, like makes my love of first law pale in comparison. Nearly broke the friendship there when she found that out. And she found it out pretty shortly before we had to choose. So she was like, well, I know what I'm choosing. So anyway, uh, so I finally finished the series, Half-Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows. I've, I've read them all now. And then she chose The Ice Dragon by George R. R. Martin because we both like George R. R. Martin and I'd never read this before. Um, and this is a very pretty book. She was like, I wanted to pick at least one book that I, I was pretty sure you would definitely like. Then for our Feminine Rage pick, she picked The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. This is nonfiction about the helo cells that are used in like medical research and like the woman who like those cells came from. It's a really interesting story. It's a really harrowing read. So like if you're thinking about picking this up, I would recommend not eating breakfast directly before reading this like I did. And then The Book That Wouldn't Burn by Mark Lawrence was the last book she chose for me. So yeah, if you want to see what I thought about them in our chat, then that's on Bookborn's channel. And if I remember, I will leave a link down below. Okay, back to Goodreads. Perdido Street Station by China Mieville. And this was my first China Mieville and certainly not my, well, actually not my last even in this, this wrap up, but definitely not my last. I really, really, really liked uh, Perdido Street Station. Perdido Street Station. I have a video on my channel, uh, should you read Perdido Street Station video? Um, because this is a very bizarre book that I do think that going in blind in terms of the specifics is great because you should kind of like let it wash over you. I think just kind of like let it happen to you is the best approach, but also this is super duper not for everybody. So I do think having like, a, like an inkling of like the type of thing it's gonna be, even though the, if you don't know the specifics is good because this is apps like when I was reading it, like I didn't know anything about it when I started. I just heard that it was like generally praised. So I was intrigued. And yeah, when I started reading and I was like, wow, I, I just, wow, what? <laughs> I think I said in my Discord, because we read this um, as a buddy read, not a vlog. Yeah, I think we read it as a buddy read. So we do like a live chat for that. And I think in the Discord, when we were chatting about it, I said that I was <laughs> imagining like, if I was uh, not like a published writer, you know, well, I'm not a published writer. I'm not trying to be able to published author. I'm just like some guy, some gal like writing, like, because I have aspirations to be an author. And like my family knows that like, I've been like, you know, chipping away at a manuscript. And then I presented them with Perdido Street Station. <laughs> and if like my friends and family were reading my manuscript and it was this, they'd be like, are you okay? <laughs> Should we call someone? Are you good? Do you need medical attention? Because <laughs> it's very strange. But it is my kind of strange. Again, wordsmith, China Mieville. Prose, prose is great. China Mieville is interested in a lot of things that I'm interested in. So like with the things he wants to explore, the things he kind of wants to attempt to tackle in the narrative are things that I'm personally quite interested in. And that is therefore then of interest to me to see that explored. So that's also a big thing that like if those aren't things you're interested in, if those aren't like questions or like philosophical quandaries that particularly like tickle your gray cells, then you'll probably be like, I mean, I get it, but like, I don't care. I love it. And if you have extremely similar taste to me, then I can recommend it, but it's a very weird book. So if you have heard of it and are considering it, you know, 
maybe give it a go but it's it's very very weird so just be warned <laughs> but yeah i think i give this five stars if it was like 4.5 maybe but yeah i really liked it and i do plan to read um what's it called the scar is the second one i think uh, this series is the new chromosome series so i have the second one and i will be getting the third one i have the broke combining editions which are very pretty no, this is not that if you're like that's not that pretty liana you're correct um the broken binding edition of of Perdido is right there and I have the scar yonder on the table and what's the third one called something about a city I think I don't know but I've ordered that too all right all right all right one perfect couple by Ruth Ware I generally like Ruth Ware it's hit and miss like with most thrillers and thriller authors I really really loved the first Ruth Ware book that I ever read. It's kind of a downhill ever since because I've never liked any of them as much as that first one, which was her retelling of The Turn of the Screw. What was it? The Turn of the Key, I think. I really, really liked that a lot. The others I've read from Ruth Ware have been like fine. So anyway, One Perfect Couple isn't really a thriller, uh, or I shouldn't say that. It is a thriller. It's not a mystery. I, and I think a lot of people, sort of think of thrillers as necessarily including a mystery component where that's part of the thrillerness of it is the not knowing who's behind this or what's really happening that's part of the thrill so this isn't that so i think uh, maybe if i'd known that i wouldn't have picked it up at all but i think it would i would have felt as i kept waiting for the twist but there isn't one because like you know what's happening and who's doing the thing of what's happening like okay there is technically a twist at the end but like not much of one. It's more just kind of like completing the picture at the end where like you get additional information that kind of, yeah, like fills in some blanks. You know the entire time, like what's happening and who and who's doing it. In that sense, it's more akin to like a slasher or something where like we, we're, we know that we're running away from this like a guy with a chainsaw. It's not a mystery. It's just like we, the thrill is like getting away from him because this is like a near miss. So it's more like that. Um, it is a isolated closed circle thriller not mystery because we know what's happening so it's about like um people who are all hired to be on this reality tv show that's like couples on an island and they all get stranded on the island and then you know things go from there it's good uh it's very tense because like you i think it does transport you to that sort of like isolated desperate situation pretty well but again i kept like trying to guess like how this wasn't going to be what it seemed but it was like very clearly what it seemed to be in a way that I was like, wow, the twist is going to be ha have to be super clever because as far as I can tell, it pretty much has to be what it seems like it is. I cannot see any, there's no like gray area here for where like we could be mistaken because we're not. This it, it What is happening is happening. <laughs> there's no like, but it was actually, no, like what the thing, what it seems to be going on is what's going on. And it's like bad and scary that that's happening. But like, it's not anything different from what it seems. So I think that's good to know going in. It is a good book. I did enjoy it. But I wish I could have known that and I wouldn't spend so much time trying to guess how it was gonna like trick me. Because it's not gonna trick you. It is exactly what it seems to be. I would recommend it. But yeah, good to know that, I think. Next I read The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman. At some point in here is the second one as well. But I'll get to that when I get to it, I guess. I didn't like the first one that much. It was okay. Like, it seemed to me like the non-speculative adult murder mystery equivalent of the kind of enjoyment people get from Harry Potter, from the first Harry Potter books. Or the first Harry Potter books, like there's a lot of like just kind of fluff about being at school and eating fun foods and being a wizard that's like not really driving the plot forward and not really like doing anything for the story or even for good world building. But it's just like, ah, so vibey and cozy to be at a wizarding school, eating fun candy. How fun is that to imagine? Thursday Murder Club was kind of that, but like with a murder mystery. So it's like um, a retirement community or at the very least a bunch of retirees. But I think they live in a retirement community. I forget now. Anyway, um, they um, are murder enthusiasts. And then of course, you know, end up getting involved with and solving a murder of their own. And it was just like a bit too twee for me. I'm a first law girly and I kept like waiting for one of these, like, I just, I just thought that the, like, the seeming niceness was maybe like a facade, a veneer, and that we were gonna find out that these, like, sweet old people are actually, like, you know, or at least some of them that seem the extra sweetest are actually, like, behind it or whatever. But that didn't happen. They're just kind of all twee and cute and idiosyncratic, and it's fine. Like, I, I get why people like it. It's, it's cute. I think, uh, I think they are adapting it, and I think I would like the adaptation better. Because that sort of like vibes based enjoyment most of the time works better for me on screen than in a book because vibes on screen then I can also enjoy the visuals and the music and all that sort of thing. In a book 
I kind of want the story to be good. Like vibes is fine and I like a bit of vibes as well. But something that's like basically entirely the enjoyment is vibes. I don't really like that in a book. In a, in a movie or a show, I can be on board for that, depending. So I, I get it. I, I get why people like it so much. It's not that great to me. <laughs> Next up, I read another book that I'm going to direct you to my previous video. Um, and that is A Fate Inked in Blood by Daniel L. Jensen. Talked about this in my romanticy video. So go check that out. I think... Did I give this three stars? I want to say I gave it three stars. I did indeed give it three stars. Next is the next Mur uh, Thursday Murder Club book. So I did read The Man Who Died Twice. When I read the first one and I took a glance at like the Goodreads reviews, a lot of them said that the second book was way better, like a big step up. Because I think The Thursday Murder Club was Richard Osman's debut novel as well, not just the first book in that series. And a lot of reviews were saying that like, oh, Thursday Murder Club is, it's cute. But The Man Who Died Twice, the, sec the second one is like, markedly better. I do think it is better. I would agree with that, but I don't think it's that much better. Like, I don't think I'm gonna read the rest of the series. Like, again, I get it that it's cute and sweet and people really like these characters. And again, in an adaptation, I think I'd be much more, like, into it. Both books, they, they drag a bit and they kind of jump around so much between perspectives. It's kind of hard I wouldn't necessarily say hard to follow, although a little bit sometimes hard to follow. More so it's just like hard for me to latch on even to these vibes. Like if we're gonna do this whole vibes based thing, then let me just kind of like linger in the vibes. But we hop around so much. It's just too much. I wish we would just kind of pick our POVs and stick with them instead of we get the villain POV and we get the main characters POVs and we get like so many POVs. It's too many. I don't care. <laughs> Again, I get it why people like it so much. It's just not really my cup of tea. I will watch the adaptation if and when that comes out. Uh, the next two books will once more direct you to my previous video, my romanticy video. And those are <laughs> Five Broken Blades by Mae Corland, which I think I gave one star, and Heaven Breaker by Sarah Wolf, which I think I gave two stars. So that should tell you something, I think. <laughs> oh god. The next book I read forgot I wrote this. I read this for a patron vlog. The winner, like the, the poll winner for what I would read for the vlog was Dealer's Choice. So I brought this upon myself, sort of, sort of. This book was gifted to me a while ago, quite a while ago. And I couldn't bring myself either to read it or to get rid of it. So I just kind of had it. And when a uh, Dealer's Choice won again, I was like, you know, it might be kind of fun slash funny to read this for a vlog. And I was like, best case scenario, I end up loving it, which would be cool. But if I don't, then it will probably make for entertaining content. And the book was The Viking Chief's Marriage Alliance. So it's very shiny. The Viking Chief's Marriage Alliance by Lucy Morris, which is a Viking romance. It's a, it's a Harlequin historical. This was gifted to me because I am on record as being trash for Vikings. Um, it was, was really not good. This was really, really, really not good. Like worse than I thought. I was like, well, I probably won't like it and it'll be probably like funny to watch me kind of cringe at it. I wish I had just been cringing at it. I was furious. I was so mad at so many things in this book. From the historical components, which you know how I am about that, to the romance component. The romance in this book? <laughs> Whose fantasy is this? <laughs> what? What? What are we doing with this? So anyway, um, yeah, I didn't really expect to like it. I kind of, you know, hoped that maybe, possibly I would, but I didn't have high hopes and boy, boy was this terrible. It did make for a pretty amusing vlog, so got something out of it. The next book I read was The Library at Mount Char by Scott Hawkins, which I also read with my patrons as a buddy read, so we did a chat about it. And um, I really don't like this book. I really, really don't like this book. This book is like if American Gods was shitty. What did I say? I think my review of it on Goodreads was like, what did I say? I th I'm sure it was terribly witty, whatever I said. Oh yeah, I said American Gods meets Umbrella Academy, but make it devoid of meaning or substance. <laughs> yeah, well that pretty much says it all. I think this is, I, for people that love this, I mean, you can like what you like. I'm not the boss of you, but what? <laughs> there are better books out there that do something like this and just like actually have something to say, you know? This was, this just felt like it was wasting my time. What would the, was the point of this? I just, I'm so baffled why people like this. Um, I'm not at all surprised that the author hasn't written anything else because I would say this author is lacking talent and they barely were able to put this together. Unput downable, compulsively readable, as you sit on a throne of lies. I think all of the blurbs on here are from publications, not from authors, which is 
not necessarily significant, but it is interesting. I feel like usually it's a combination of authors as well as publications with blurbs, but not a single author blurb. Interesting. Anyway, yeah, uh, I think I give this one, maybe two stars. Do not recommend. Uh, the next book I read was Gone Tonight by Sarah Pekkanen. And this was one where I, I think I would have given it three stars, but then the ending, unlike whatever other book I was talking about where I was talking about how the ending didn't really like do the thing, this ending did the thing. For a book that was like decent, the ending, I think I boosted it up to a four stars because of that. Because it could have ended in a way that was neat and tidy and like nice. And I kind of thought that it was going to, and then it didn't. It it went for the ambiguous ending. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. Okay, yes. You get you get points for that. So we'll bump it up to a four for that. Um, overall, it was decent. It was like decently compelling and like propulsive and mysterious where I wanted to know what happened. Characters didn't do like too stupid of stuff where I'm like, well, I have no sympathy for your situation because that was a dumbass thing to do. Occasionally some of that, but not really too much. But yeah, mostly it was just that the, the author at the end, yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't cop out, didn't um, take the nice way out. I, it, there was also like throughout the book, I kind of was uncertain about how I was meant to feel about some of the things like that were being depicted. And so then I was kind of waiting for the ending to kind of tell me like which is the author trying to tell me this is fine or is the author trying to say that this just kind of is what it is or like what are we doing with this so the way that it ended made it more clear or unclear i should say like it didn't defend like what was had been going on it didn't try to paint that in a positive light and was kind of what i was afraid it would do kind of explain it away or whatever it didn't it kind of like leaned into the ambiguity of like the oh okay yeah it's it's not that's not an easy, clean answer, which I appreciated vastly. So again, got points for that. So I would recommend it. Next up, I read The Warm Hands of Ghosts by Catherine Arden. This was so lackluster. I love the Winter Night trilogy. Where is that author? This book, it takes place in World War I, but it's like a magical version of World War I. And I think the premise is rich with potential, but the character there is like very little characterization here the characters were so like flat and uninteresting to me and then the situation and the speculative kind of like predicaments that our characters are in i just i i feel like it really did kind of like pull its punches in a way that left me not feeling anything about it and the ending was really like neat and like clean and i was like this could have been a glorious stunning gut punch of a novel and it wasn't. It was just so like tepid and so kind of vanilla. And the premise is a good one. And this author is a capable author. Like the Winter Night Trilogy author combined with this premise, that sounds like a winning combination to me. I don't know if maybe she was told to pull it back. I just, Winter Night like went there in ways that made it really like rich and poignant and beautiful, even when I didn't think it was perfect. This, it just, this just wasn't it. It was like competent. Like it's not a bad book. It's, it's executed adequately, but that's just so much worse. I mean, honestly, I'd rather read a bad book then because you know, actually that's not true. But like, I think I gave this three stars because it was inoffensive, but I want, this should be a riot of emotion. I should feel hope and despair. I should be wowed by the horror and the beauty. I should, ugh, just so much like missed potential here. I just, I don't know what happened. So anyway, a spectacular tour de force. Yeah, it should have been. It's not though. Stunning cover, 10 out of 10, once again. Oh yeah. Next book is a book that I also read with my patrons, but I think it wasn't like the official buddy read. I think I like tacked it on. So we'd also talk about it kind of like I do with Jean Wolfe because after reading Pretty Doe Street Station, I really wanted to read more China Mieville. And this was, it either had just come out or was about to come out. So we read The Book of Elsewhere by Keanu Reeves and China Mieville. This has gotten a lot of like really mixed reviews and I kind of understand why. Cause you know, China Mieville already is like an author where I'm like, yeah, he's definitely not gonna be for everyone. I love this book. I really love this book. I think I gave it five stars. I've never read Berserker. I kind of want to now. Not really so much because like this book suddenly like made me want to. It's just that, I mean, I guess, the, I mean, this book is what made me want to, but not, I don't feel, I guess what I'm trying to say is this isn't a book where I want you to think that the expectation you should have is reading this book is going to make you like desperately desirous of reading Berserker, like where it leaves you like hooked for that. It's more just that like, I kind of got more of a taste of like what 
what Berserker is kind of about. And I didn't really know what Berserker was about. So now that I know what Berserker is about, I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of an interesting premise that I wasn't like totally aware that that's what it was about. And that actually sounds decently interesting. I might be interested in reading Berserker then is more why I'm interested. But anyway, um, so you don't, again, I never read Berserker. So as to the question of do you need to have read Berserker, no, I don't. Maybe I would like it better. Maybe I would like it worse. I don't know how I would feel about it differently if I had read Berserker first. I cannot answer that question. We are not in that timeline. I think this does so much of what I want speculative fiction to do and so rarely find that it does. This book, it's kind of plotless. <laughs> Shouldn't maybe start by a list. I was like, I want speculative fiction to be plotless. Like, that's not what I mean. It's um, it's kind of like a series of vignettes almost, where we're sort of exploring a concept and exploring some questions through various angles, through various lenses, for, through various perspectives. So in the way that like American Gods I've described as being kind of an impressionist mosaic, where you kind of don't really get it until you see the whole thing because it's sort of these disparate pieces that once you finish it, it like forms the whole picture. So it's kind of a weird and potentially sloggy reading experience because you're kind of just like getting a piece of it at a time as you're like filling in the picture and then you like step back and see the whole thing. So it's not quite like that, but it's a little bit like that in that like this is exploring kind of, I mean, the, the, so the character of B from Berserker, he's the main character I suppose you would say or like this book is about him but it's more so interested in kind of exploring what it means to be like him to be in his situation to be in his position to the the reality of it the philosophy of it the existentialness of it just like that's why I said from multiple lenses multiple perspectives multiple ways to approach that so it's not really like telling a story so much as it is let's look at this from as many angles as possible to just kind of ruminate on that as a concept. And because we do it from so many different angles, there's so many kind of different uh, approaches to talking about this character in this situation. To me, this book almost feels like it's systematically one by one going through bad versions of this type of a story and really quickly showing you the right way to do it and then moving on, which is the best way to describe it. Because like the character of B, he's like an immortal being, like an immortal superhuman is like the fastest way to like, just, I mean, there's more to it, but essentially, you know, that's what's going on with him. So there's a lot of books, there's a lot of movies that have that type of a character, that type of a situation, and they do it badly. And there's multiple ways to do that badly. There's no one way to do that wrong. There's so many ways that people do that badly in a way that irritates me and upsets me and annoys me and I hate it. And so there are books that treat that romantically. There are books that treat that thrillingly. There are books that treat that heroically. There are books that there's all these kind of like different ways that stories have approached that and done it badly. And because we're approaching this character from so many different angles, so many different parts of like him and his life and um, people's perspectives on him, we we quickly we do like the romance thing and we show you how that's how that should be done. And then we move on. And we do like the existential part of it. And we show you how that should be done. And we move on. And we do the day to dayness of it. And we show you how that should be done. And we move on. And it just feels like, again, systematically one by one, point by point, like going down the list of ways that people have portrayed this type of a character and being like, no, no, hold my beer. <laughs> so watch like reading this I just felt like I was like watching this this happen and just cheering for it chapter by chapter vignette by vignette just kind of going like yes yes this is it this is how you do it this is how you do it right yes 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 so by the end I was like yes fuck yes this is how you do it this is what I want this is perfect this is the book I want to like shove in the face of the books that do it badly and be like this is how you do it. This is, he gets it. They get it. This is how you handle it. So I fucking love this book. People who don't like it, like I get it. It's not really a story. And China Me Evil is weird, whatever. This is what I want from my speculative fiction. So to be clear, when people are like, oh, you'll like the second book from Adrian Tchaikovsky's series because that's the type of book you want. No, this is the type of book that I want. Okay. Moving on. Uh, the next book I read was The Midnight Feast by Lucy Foley. And it was good. It wasn't like the best ever. Um, I think it was like fine for what it is. It's not the most thrilling thriller, but it had good atmosphere. And what did I say? I think I compared it to something. What did I compare it to? Oh yeah, I compared it to The White Lotus, which I do think is fitting. Cause it's not like a super edge of your seat type of thriller. It doesn't have like twist after twist and OMG moment, but it does have this sardonic tone that's sort of satirizing the rich in a way that that's not like the entire conceit of the story. That's not the entire point of it. But White Lotus is a bit of a, a thriller that satirizes the rich. 
and that's kind of the tone of Midnight Feast. So if you like The White Lotus, I would really, really recommend this book because I think it's going to give you a lot of the same, again, the same tone and the same sort of type of narrative. And like, The White Lotus also isn't super thrilling and action packed. It just sort of has generally a kind of a slow paced mystery going on in both seasons, in addition to satirizingly rich. So that's again, what's kind of going on here. We do have a mystery. That's kind of what this book is about, but it's not again, edge of your seat type of stuff. So yeah. I really do feel confident saying if you like The White Lotus and if that's your expectation going in, that that's the kind of thing you're going to get here, I think you'll really enjoy The Midnight Beast. Uh, the next book I read was The Middle of the Night by Riley Sager. And that was terrible. Okay, I shouldn't say terrible. It's not the worst Riley Sager book I've ever read. I don't think any Riley Sager book will ever be as bad as the worst one that I ever read. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I, you know, maybe challenge accepted. He could probably write something worse. I don't know. I read it for a patron vlog because again, I, Riley Sager books, they're almost never good, at least not to me. Like, I don't think they're good books. But most of the time when I'm reading a Riley Sager book, I enjoy the experience up until the end. And then we find out what's been going on. We find out the answer to the mystery, etc. And I'm like, oh, that was as dumb as hell. <laughs> but getting to that point, it's usually been like a edge of your seat, vibey, propulsively readable good time. So I enjoy the journey because it's a page turner that I'm like, oh, what's gonna happen? What does it mean? And then I inevitably come to what it means and I'm like oh it's stupid. That's why I couldn't guess the twist because the twist makes no sense. Middle of the Night was actually one of the most boring Riley Sager books I've ever read and then the answer it wasn't as bad it wasn't as stupid as some of the other answers that I've had from Riley Sager books but it wasn't a great answer and it was a bit stupid. So it was kind of in some senses the actual worst book I've read and not because it's the worst in terms of quality but because I didn't even have like a fun time reading a bad book. It was slightly better than some of the others but then therefore boring and not still not good. So yeah I, I would not recommend that. If you want to read a Riley Sager book like that's fun and stupid <laughs> there's lots of those. This one is neither fun nor totally stupid but it's not smart either. It's it's just kind of nothing. And the last book, let's get you off the floor. I'll let you do belong on the floor. Uh, the last book that I read was The Familiar by Lee Bardugo and this was terrible. I really, really, really hate this book. This was so, so bad. So, so bad. Kind of, okay, not nearly, the, the Warm Hands of Ghosts is not nearly as bad as this, but kind of like with Warm Hands of Ghosts where I was like, where's the author that wrote Winter Night? So with this, I'm like, where's the author that gave us Kaz Brecker? That gave us Six of Crows? Like, I'm really starting to think that Lee Bardugo just like had one good one in her and it was Six of Crows and like she just shot her wad on that because Ninth House was like, mm, and the second one was not good. And then this, really not good. What else is she read? Oh, the, the continuation of Grisha, not great. And it's weird because I feel like all Lee Bardugo books, except Six of Crows duology, have a really similar like formula and setup for the character situation and the character dynamic. They kind of all follow the same blueprint, except Six of Crows. And again, maybe like I almost want to conspiracy theorize that Six of Crows was written by someone else and she stole it. It's so different. It's so different and it's so good. This... <sighs> This is such a nothing of a book. What an absolute waste of potential. There is nothing to be said here for characterization or say, how did you, this is historical fantasy about the Spanish Inquisition. How did you make that boring and lifeless and devoid of anything uh, either sensory or emotional. I I just, I'm on, I feel like almost that takes talent. I, I feel like it, it takes active effort to make the Spanish Inquisition boring. Stunning cover, 11 out of 10 because she's Lee Bardugo, so they're gonna pull out all the stops for her. But I wish this book deserved it because a book that look that it has contents that match this cover, that, that delivers on what it promises in terms of being rich, vivid, historical fantasy for adults set in the Spanish Inquisition, that sounds phenomenal. And this is the farthest thing from phenomenal. What is this? And that's my wrap up for quarter three. I will hopefully get my quarter four wrap up done closer to when the quarter ends, but we will see how that goes. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know all the things and I'll see you in my next video. Thank you.